Okay, sounds good. So just give me one second. So uh, one moment, let me just share the screen. And we'll be one second. Okay, sorry, just give me uh, just one second. All right, perfect. So, uh, so, so let's uh, get going. Uh, so, my name is Alexander Sokol. This is the second day of the workshop, uh, Practical Machine Learning for Quantitative Finance. And uh, we will continue where we left off from yesterday. So yesterday, uh, you know, we, we spent some time going over the theory of how uh, machine learning can be used for uh, finance, quant finance, and specifically we selected um, a problem um, uh, of interest rate risk in real world measure. And uh, we've discussed uh, how to formulate the problem properly for uh, uh, machine learning, you know, to be able to uh, attack it with machine learning. Uh, it turns out that uh, the problem of risk has to be formulated in a slightly different way from what we used to as quants uh, in order to apply machine learning to it. Uh, in particular, when we're using traditional Monte Carlo simulation or other techniques, we're thinking about short time horizons and uh, when we're looking at equations, we're thinking about continuous uh, time. So, um, you know, d delta T or DT or DZ uh, is infinitesimal time in which the stochastic differential, differential equation is defined. It turns out that for machine learning, this is actually counterproductive uh, because we don't have this DE. So there is no need for us to compute or estimate any parameters in continuous time. And instead it makes sense to formulate the model for discrete time horizon or for finite rather time horizon. And uh, we've been looking at this time horizon um, uh, of uh, two years, five years and so forth. And uh, it turns out that we can build, use machine learning to build a model for this finite time horizon, then uh, extend it further by multiples of this time horizon and interpolate between these horizons. And yesterday, uh, we went over the first part of the workshop, uh, which, uh, or the theory for that rather, which had to do with um, models for regression, right? So in uh, machine learning, there are two types of models. There are generative models and regression models. So the difference between them is that um, uh, regression models are used to uh, estimate parameters. Uh, some of them are classifiers, uh, you know, some, so, you know, the regression models are part of the broader model family uh, of, discrim of um, uh, discriminative models as opposed to generative. So discriminative models, people normally think of discriminative models as uh, things like classifiers. You know, you basically say, well, it's a cat or it's a dog, uh, you know, or something uh, in that, um, you know, vein. But uh, this is broader family. Uh, it also includes things, models that can be used for regression. So I prefer to call generative models, generative models, and any other type of model, non-generative model. Because discriminative model, uh, even though it's formally includes regression models, for example, but uh, it makes it a little bit unclear if uh, regression models really um, are included in that category. So use generative models are the ones that can generate new samples, um, new samples of uh, features, right? So in other words, you give it some data for training and it can generate more data for you. And non-generative models cannot. So yesterday we're looking at non-generative models, specifically regression models. Today we'll be looking at generative models. Now, before we get going and before we start with today's slides, uh, we need to uh, finish tomorrow's uh, examples because uh, we spent a lot of time on the theory which applied both to yesterday material and today's material. And we ran some examples, but we didn't run a lot of examples. So the first uh, 20 to 30 minutes of today's workshop will depend on uh, regression models. So this is the topic from yesterday's session. And we'll run the examples. So we already discussed uh, how to formulate the problem uh, for uh, machine learning. We discussed how to approach it, but we didn't actually run anything and we didn't look at the code, or at least did not in detail. So today, you know, so, so the starting point today will be continuing yesterday's session. 
for about 30 minutes. And after that, we'll take a short break for a few minutes to, for questions. And then we, uh, I will go to the slides for today's session on generating model. All right, so first of all, uh, just um, uh, uh, again, you know, it, 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 as I wanted to, you know, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, as well as today, so we have, uh, I have my colleagues um, uh, uh, on Zoom right now. So if anybody would like to run the models as I'm running them, so I'll be running models right now. If anybody uh, is planning uh, to follow uh, or do something else with the code and uh, run the models, so you certainly everybody is welcome to do that during the workshop. And uh, if you'd like to uh, go to a breakout room and work one-on-one -on -one with uh, one of my colleagues, uh, certainly uh, uh, fine. Uh, please let them know through the chat. Also, if there are any questions during uh, the presentation, uh, please type them in the chat and my colleagues will let me know through the direct message uh, and I will then be able to um, answer them uh, you know, either immediately or a little bit later. All right, so uh, the code I will be running is on GitHub. Uh, I changed the name of the repository, the old one will be for it, just a little bit shorter. So it's a uh, compact uh, GitHub slash compatible practical machine learning. So I, I, I sent it um, uh, to the chat yesterday. So let me just type it in the chat again, uh, just so everybody has the, uh, has the URL if you'd like to download the repository. And uh, the same repository is now open in PyCharm. And we already uh, looked at, you know, you need to run uh, pip install minus r uh, requirements. Uh, so it will load TensorFlow and a few other libraries I could learn. Uh, so uh, the Python code would run. Okay, now for the, uh, for the um, uh, examples, uh, we'll use the following approach. So first of all, there are unit tests. They just to make sure that everything is installed properly, already random. Uh, if you are installing uh, or you know downloading or cloning the repository, it makes sense to run the unit tests to make sure that they succeed. That would mean that you set up, set up everything correctly. And then there is a folder runs. So what I did here is that uh, there are some calculations here that take a long time to run. And these calculations, uh, uh, you know, we don't want to wait, you know, five, 10 minutes. Actually, for some of the generated models that we're planning to run at the end of the uh, session today, they actually take one hour to run. And in production, when using them for risk management, that's perfectly fine because, uh, first of all, uh, you know, it's on my laptop, it's one hour. Uh, you know, of course, if you're using, uh, you know, production infrastructure, it will be faster uh, because you can uh, run parallel. Uh, but also, uh, you know, when you're doing uh, risk, uh, you know, you, you're basically simulating interest rate risk factors once and then you're using them to price the portfolio. So pricing the portfolio is normally the bottleneck. So for these two reasons, uh, it's okay to run these models for risk, but in the workshop format, these are difficult models to run because uh, with uh, uh, discrete with regression models, they're actually quite fast. They, even, even at full uh, settings, they uh, still take only a few minutes. With the generative models, they are longer to train uh, and uh, you don't actually get uh, anything good looking when you train them in a few seconds, right? So it's not like, you know, you, you get the main uh, idea of how the distribution would look like uh, in a few seconds of trading, and then you just refine it further. So they don't really converge until uh, you know you, you run for some time. So we will run some examples uh, on the simpler data sets uh, live, uh, but then I will uh, I just ran them uh, on, um, uh, uh, on, uh, on a large machine, and uh, at the end of the workshop, uh, you know, to make sure that we don't have to wait an hour. I'm just going to open uh, basically the results in a folder that I just ran them, but you will be able to run uh, the same uh, calculations and get the same results uh, on your machine, just not live during the workshop because it takes uh, more than a few minutes. All right, so with that, uh, let me just go here. So, so the examples I will be running here, almost all of them we can run, actually all of them I can run live. Uh, some of them I just ran in advance because we don't, I, we don't wanna wait uh, and lose even a few minutes, but uh, nothing here runs more than you know two, three minutes. So uh, let me first go to the model folder. So in the model folder, as we discussed yesterday, we built uh, three models. So one is just standard Holland White model. So that's the classic, uh, you know, grandfather of all of the interest rate models. In fact, it's not even Holland White, it's more like Pesicek. Uh And uh, this model, uh, you know, if you look at, um, uh, if you look at this model, uh, let me just, uh, one second, close, close this. Uh, please confirm that you can see my screen. Can someone uh, unmute themselves and just make sure that uh, you're looking at the screen? I'm sharing it. We can see your screen. Okay, perfect. Right, okay. So this is, uh, I call this Holland White model because, uh, you know, here, you know, 2021 is kind of ridiculous uh, saying the word Vesicek model because it's really model from the 70s. Uh, but it's really a Vesicek model. It's just flat parameters. And the reason is our purpose is not to model interest, rate perfect, interest rates perfectly. 
uh, our purpose here is to generate toy data that we can then analyze using machine learning so we can prove that our model our machine learning model does the right thing thing is uh, you know with real data you don't have multiple economies which are identical right you don't have uh, you know 500 years of history for the interest rates so with real data uh, you can never definitively say that if you're predicting uh, is really completely accurate so when you generate synthetic data uh, you can actually make sure that uh, whatever machine learning produced for you is exactly accurate because you can run this conventional model like Helen White model and also have a couple of more advanced models uh, for a very long time and get data to whatever precision you'd like and then you can run machine learning and, uh, and compare it and that's what we're doing. So this model uh, is uh, Helen White, it has constant reversion rate, constant volatility and so forth. Of course the results uh, at long horizons look uh, a little bit absurd because there are very negative rates, there are very high rates, it's not the point, right? So the point is that we know what the properties are, so we can see uh, if machine learning can reproduce it. So uh, let me run it quickly, right? And uh, we'll look at the chart. So, uh, uh, you know, making sure that, um, to make sure that uh, we don't kind of get lost uh, in multiple browser windows in the Zoom session, which are difficult to wrangle. Uh, I just made uh, the code now to uh, save the, the um, images uh, or the figures on disk, and then we'll see them in a list of files here appearing, and we will be able to open them. However, in uh, file plot underscore util.py, uh, there is a, in the beginning a flag. Uh, if you'd like to uh, reproduce the results, but view them in the browser, you can turn the flag on. Now, it, as I mentioned yesterday, so this underscore one, underscore two, underscore three, uh, these are different settings. Uh, so sometimes these are different currencies. In this particular case, it's a synthetic data. So this is just different number of currencies and different number of years of simulation. So this is four currencies, which are currency one, two, and three, and four. Uh, and uh, we're going to look at 30 year uh, horizon for that. So I'm just going to open this and run. And uh, what this will do is uh, it will produce historical chart. It will produce the chart uh, of uh, essentially what we will be training on. Uh, and uh, we will be able also to look at uh, conventional statistics, which is obtained by bucketing the rates, right? So taking all of the points uh, for which the initial, uh, all of the time series points where initial rate fell into, let's say, a bucket from 5% to 6% and seeing what is the distribution of the endpoints, which is exactly how we uh, empirically with conventional statistics can discover the probability distribution. So the red files here, so PyCharm, uh, which is the uh, development environment I'm using, it shows the files that are not committed to Git in red, right? So the red files mean that I just generated them. White files mean that they existed before and in, in they're in a repo. So first of all, let's look at history. Right? Short rate history, there is a C3 file with the data. You can actually look at it as well. <clears throat> There's the PNG file, right? So we have four currencies. We randomly generated the starting points. They all happen to be just on the high side, but you know, it's random. Uh, and uh, media version brought them down, right? So this is the history for the four currencies. Uh, and uh, the sample here, uh, will look, um, uh, one second here. Yeah, so the sample here will look like this. And uh, what happens here is that even though we just have four currencies, but we're mixing all of these currencies together. So over 30 years, there are these various starting points, which go monthly. There are these various ending points. So this chart again, so this chart is not very useful in conventional uh, stochastic models, but it's incredibly useful when you're doing machine learning because essentially it shows you what your sample is, right? So on X axis, you have the first point in the sample. In the Y axis, you have second point in the sample you are training it on these pairs. So each point here is the pair of short rate today and short rate in five years that you're training the model. The idea is that when you train the model, then you plug in today's short rate and it will give you either the mean, if it's a regression model, or the samples, if it's a generative model of the future short rate in, you know, in, in the future. So this plot of, plot, you know, of essentially today's state variable versus the same state variable five years later, is exactly how a trained machine learning model, uh, and uh, that's a little bit unusual type of chart that is not really common in quant literature. But just wait, you know, as machine learning uh, models become more prevalent, uh, I would predict that this chart uh, would be very frequently encountered in all literature. All right. So uh, now, if I'm going to <clears throat> Uh, look at, um, uh, you know, th this data is just not enough data here, right? So I'm going to run uh, a little bit more. So this is the second chart, I'm, the second uh, script I'm running. So it runs a little bit longer, but still pretty quick. So now I generated something, you know, more data, right? So that's more useful. Uh, and I can look at the history as well. 
and uh, what I will see is that there are more starting points. So here there's a hundred currencies. And again, some of them uh, randomly, st basically starting point is random. So these currencies, they start at minus 10%, 30%, of course, again, so this is, the goal here is not to be realistic, but to, to have a simple equation that we can then recover through machine learning. And, and mini version brings it to a more narrow range. Okay, and the sample uh, looks like this, right? So what does it mean? If you had the short rate uh, in the hollow weight model at starting point of let's say 10%, then the slice through these points tells you the range of short rate five years later, right? So if your starting point is 10% interest rate, it goes from 4% to also, you know, a little bit above 10%. The reason is that it is mid reverting, right? So there's volatility, but also it, it, it's going down. And uh, you look at the uh, yellow line, right? So it, in, it's intercept with um, uh, the X equal Y line is at 5% because that's the mid reversion target. So the thing is that that should be absolutely the straight line, right? So the, the correct answer here is a straight line. I, you can see that as you, um, uh, so I, I, this uh, script number three, it runs uh, probably three or four minutes. So I just ran it in advance and it looks like that, right? So it's completely straight line. Uh, and in fact, uh, this is also a straight line. So the volatility is flat at uh, 1%. Uh, the, um, so this is, uh, so this level of green line is exactly 1% times square root of five, right? Uh, and this line is straight. It's a, it's a, it's a linear dependence and it uh, crosses uh, X equal Y line exactly at 5%, right? So uh, in the interactive chart, I was able to click away the blue points, which I cannot do here because it's an image it was saved. But uh, if you click away, the, or if you remove the blue points, you will discover that the yellow line here intercepts X equal y, y line at five because that's the universal target. All right, so, well, that's exactly what we wanted to get. All right, so now uh, let me um, show you uh, what it looks like with the two economy, right? So this thing was one economy. By one economy, I mean the following, right? So if you look at the um, uh, code here, uh, there are multiple currencies. Right, so we generate the currencies. There are 50 currencies, and we generate currencies C in the number of currency, or, or currency, you know, order, 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 basically currencies are one, two, three, four, you know, two, two fifty. But as you can see here, all of the model parameters are the same, right? So one percent volatility, one ten percent mean aversion. I made it a little bit stronger just so it's easier to see the effect uh, for the purposes of the workshop, <clears throat> and a mean aversion target of five percent. So. These 50 currencies have the same settings, right? So, so this is almost like different time periods in the life of the same country or 50 identical countries. Uh, so let's imagine that you know each of our 50 states uh, in the United States uh, had its own currency. Uh, some of them would like to, you know, I think, but uh, but they don't, right? But if they did, and imagine that all the states were identical, right? That would how it would look, right? So model parameters are the same, but uh, random forces are different. So uh, it's different path of the interest rates in each of these currencies, but um, uh, but the same uh, model parameters. So if you look at um, uh, this, right, you will see that uh, essentially this line that uh, that we produced, um, uh, it's basically the parameters of this model. Okay, now uh, if I go to the um, uh, let me just close the, close uh, all of this chart so we don't get um, uh, confused uh, which 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 ones are which. So if you go to two economy. Uh, what's going to happen here is that um, uh, you will have, uh, and again, let, let me run, you know, a couple of these, uh, and then the third one I run in advance. All right, so that's produced uh, these files. Uh, so I will go straight to the file that I ran previously. All right, so but you know they will look similar, right? So that's the that's the file that I just ran right now. This one. Right, I'm going to just have slightly more data, right? So it kind of looks similar, right? But you see, this is no longer a straight line. Okay, so, well, the reason it's no longer a straight line is because there are two economies here. And uh, the way that I can see that there are two economies is as follows. If I bucket, right? So if I go and uh, I bucket, uh, so all of the data points, uh, let's say between 10 and 11%, but if I do it by currency, so what will happen is that I will be able to uh, see the average drift of interest rate in each currency. And I can clearly see that there are two groups here. The first group is where the 
mean of drift. Basically, what the chart is essentially is the drift or is the new rate mean of the rate in five years as a function of today's rate, which is really the difference between X and Y here is a drift. Right, so the, if the drift is positive, this will be higher. If the drift is negative, this will be lower than the initial point. So you see that there are two lines here, right? So this line is for even odd currencies, and this line is for even currencies. And you can see that you can do even currencies and you can do odd currencies, right? So you see that uh, so the, now this data is separate, right? So all of the even currencies have one settings. So one, you know, dynamics of interest rates, and all of the odd currencies have different dynamics of the interest rates. So it's almost like, uh, again, so imagine in the United States, each of the 50 states would have its own currency. But let's say, uh, you know, red states, uh, you know, they have one fiscal policy, blue states, they have the other fiscal policy. For those of you who are not familiar with US politics, blue is uh, Democrat uh, and uh, red is Republican. So, uh, you know, these parties have different fiscal uh, views on fiscal policy. So blue states would have, uh, you know, one set of interest rate settings and or, or calibration parameters, rest states would have another. So here, uh, if you do that, right, uh, it looks like just, you know, some dynamics that's common, right? But in fact, it consists of two different types of uh, interest rates. So the objective for machine learning is to be able to recover it from multi-currency data sets. So it's kind of a preview of what uh, we're going to do, right? So we're going to, uh, so they, here we have the benefit of, uh, what's, you know, it's supervised learning or, 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 or just knowing the answer, right? So I wouldn't even call it supervised learning. So here we know, okay, so these are one group of currencies, these are the other group of currencies, so we just plotted them together. What we will try to do is to make machine learning look at this and say, hey, there are two different types here. Just like you look at, you know, machine learning can look at pets and say there are cats and there are dogs. I don't know what these are, but there are two kinds. So machine learning that we build, in, it, it's an incredibly simple model. We'll look at this data and say, hey, there are two kinds of currencies here. So that's, that's the objective. All right, so let me um, uh, let me uh, uh, now go to the um, uh, so so that that basically was how we generated the data. Okay, so now uh, that we've generated the data, right? Let's um, uh, go and look uh, at how we can analyze the data. So we're going to analyze the data uh, with a very simple um, uh, uh, feedforward neural network. All right, so it's all the same. There are multiple scripts here, but really it's the same. So it's called short rate DNN. So it's a one factor. Um, uh, so it's a, a neural network for one factor model. And uh, I'm going to go to the implementation of that class and just quickly go, to, go through how it works. So first of all, uh, not to you know, go too much into coding details, but um, uh, you see this library called utters. This is actually very similar to data class, uh, PyDancing or a number of other libraries. What it does is that uh, it just makes it easier to have a data class, right? So class which has data attributes. So, uh, you know, this is something that uh, basically, if you're not familiar with the library, just uh, remember that once you do that, anything here becomes an instance variable in Python, right? So not a static variable as it otherwise would be, right? So we have here uh, some parameters of the network, right? So, so you can define them and uh, whatever I have here, when I'm running it, uh, I can uh, set, right? So learning rate, for example, is 5% uh, here, right? So now the, um, uh, uh, the uh, implementation is here, so it's extremely simple. And uh, let me just very quickly go through it. All right. So uh, what we do is we use Keras, uh, which is a Python front end to TensorFlow, and we build extremely simple feedforward network in which there are three layers. First layer is the normalizer, which makes sure that uh, the variables that we pass to the model, the training data set, is normalized to to a, to a consistent range, right? Because uh, basically, if you don't do that, uh, you know the the the, new, the neurons, the neurons, um, you know the basic units of the neural network, uh, they have a natural scale. We're going to use sigmoid, uh, and I'll explain in a second uh, why we're doing that. Uh, but, uh, you know, also there are multiple other units, but essentially all of these functions, uh, they change on the scale of the argument being around one, right? So what happens is if you're going to pass data to the neural network that has a scale of 0 0.01 or 100, uh, this will not be in the range, you know, you basically want to have the nonlinear effect, right? If, if your activation units would be linear, this would be the principal component analysis, right? So that, that's what this network would do. What makes it machine learning 
is the nonlinearity. Nonlinearity, and with nonlinearity, uh, you need to. It's you know, like for example, sigmoid is flat, right? Then it goes up, and then it becomes flat again, right? And so is hyperbolic tangent and a bunch of other things. Uh, there are some units which are real, like for example, which basically is uh, flat at zero, and then it goes and continues linearly. So the important thing is that the only nonlinear for the state for the for the parameter for the variable that you pass to the neuron. Uh, the only nonlinear when this parameter is around one. So that's why you need the normalizer. Uh, you need to make sure that your data is also around one because if it's not, uh, it will just not hit this nonlinear part and you will lose the ability of machine learning to adapt um, uh, to your data. Second layer is, uh, you know, there are 64 neurons here. So we're going to uh, be able to represent, um, uh, we're going to be able to represent uh, this data, you know, with basically 64. So you mentioned essentially is going to be a linear combination of 64 sigmoids, right? So think of it as a basis, right? So people are using different bases, uh, you know, you can use, uh, uh, you know, Fourier basis, you can use, uh, you know, polynomial basis, right? So when you're fitting a function, you're going to use various types of bases. Uh, polynomial, for example, right? So you have a constant, then you have linear, you have quadratics. So you can represent it as a sum of polynomials. You can represent it as a sum of Fourier functions. So here you're representing it as a sum of sigmoids. And there are 64 of them. And what's important is that there are enough of the sigmoids. So you have, uh, you know, you basically have enough flexibility. And one good thing about using sigmoid on this particular example is because, um, uh, the answer for this particular model, which is column white, is going to be a linear function, right? So this, this regression line, as we've just seen in generated data, is linear. So if I used activation units, which have a linear limit, like ReLU, for example, I would not know if it's just a fit or it's just like my, basically, uh, you know, if I'm cheating, you know, by essentially making my, activity, my neuron look similar to the answer that I'm trying to obtain. Uh, and you know that would be, of course, undesirable uh, because I would not know if machine learning works. Or, or just uh, you know, it's a, yeah, I'm looking at the shape of this uh, activation unit. So here with sigmoid, I know that if I'm getting a straight line, that really works because uh, you would not randomly get a straight line from a you know. Basically, it's a sum of it's a sum of sigmoid functions. The only reason they will add up to a straight line if this thing works, right? Because what you want, you know, what the correct answer is a straight line. They would not randomly add up to a straight line, whereas Units like ReLU can, but generally, uh, other than for this, uh, you know, consideration here, which is kind of unique uh, because our answer is a straight line that we're trying to reproduce. Uh, generally, most of them work. I mean, it doesn't matter exactly what the unit is. There are some uh, units that work better than others depending on the situation. But uh, you know, there's no, um, uh, there's no like one unit that's universally better than the others. Right? So they're, they're all good for you know the particular purpose for which they're designed. All right, so now what happens here is that there are 64 of them. So again, so just confirm what, what uh, is happening here. So if I put one here, if we have time, I don't know if we have time to be running various experiments, but if I put one here, it will just give me a sigmoid, right? So it'll be like fit to one sigmoid, right? If I put two, it will be fit to two sigmoids, right? So I have 64 and I kind of present pretty much anything. Okay, and the final layer is one, why? Because we're doing regression, right? We're just getting one variable. So uh, now this thing is the feed forward neural network and it's not deep yet, right? Well, it's not very deep, right? It has three layers. Uh, normally with a deep network, you need more layers and uh, there are various architectures or concepts there. Like for example, there is a concept of the autoencoder in which you go to funnel, right? You go to from wider layers, which have more neurons to more narrow, 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 then you widen up again. So here I'm not using autoencoder because what I want is a single answer. Right, so autoencoder is a way to compress the variable state. So for example, if I was trying to fit the yield curve and I wanted to represent yield curve with a few harmonics, what I would do is that I would start from, let's say 64 for the input data. Then I would go to, let's say three neurons or you know five neurons. Then I would again uh, go to more neurons as many as uh, the points in the yield curve. And the idea is that regularization of the network would do kind of the job of the principal components analysis. So auto in, the concept of autoencoder essentially is, uh, in, you know, is, uh, is uh, applicable when there is a high dimensional data that you suspect has low dimensional uh, structure to it. Like for example, uh, you have the yield curve that has let's say 10 or 15 data points, you know, 10, 10 or 15 yields in it. But you suspect that it will be well represented by something like Nelson Siegel, 
which is a formula with three parameters, or Nelson Siegel Swenson, which is a formula with four parameters. Right, so that's essentially a manual way to create an autoencoder. So Nelson Siegel is an autoencoder. It's just not a machine learning autoencoder, but somebody invented it because it represents complex data with a few parameters or multidimensional data with lower dimensional data in a nonlinear way. Right, and PCA is also in a way is an autoencoder. It just uh, you know happens to be linear. So I'm not doing it here because I need one output. If I wanted more outputs, right? If I wanted, for example, uh, you know, drift for if if I wanted to compute the drift or or the um, uh, mean, uh, you know, future rates for each or which maturity, I would use the autoencoder. But here I don't, uh, and uh, you know, one of the reasons uh, I chose this example is because uh, the deeper you go, the longer it takes to train, and I wanted to be able to run things uh, live during the workshop, and uh, also for every participant, uh, you know, to be able to do that who who would like to. That's why. Uh, this is, you know, and also I wanted to start from a simple example. All right, so uh, now, despite being incredibly simple, right, essentially it's a three layer network, which is uh, not deep at all, uh, it's very powerful. And we'll discover that this thing works actually much better than uh, traditional statistics. So it's deceptively simple, but in fact, it's quite uh, sophisticated. And remember, there are 64 units here, so you can do a lot of, with them, right? So it's not deep, but it's kind of white, right? So that's why it works well. All right, so uh, now with that, uh, let's see what we can uh, do with it, right? So um, so the first example I'm going to run is I'm going to go to, uh, so so this runs are organized in folders. So there's a folder called model and there's a folder called uh, DNN, which is deep neural network, right? Or feed forward network. And there's also a folder which is called RBM to which we'll get uh, at the end uh, because it's a generated model. So model is where we generate the synthetic data, which we will try to explain. Here is where we're using this data. These two data, uh, these two folders is where we're using the synthetic data, hollow white with one economy and hollow white with two economies that we just reviewed. Uh, this folder is applying exactly the same model to ECD. And this folder uh, is uh, called Marvel. So, uh, you know, if you're familiar with Marvel comics or the movies that Hollywood uh, recently started to make based on those comics, you know that there are some countries there, um, you know, that uh, that are imaginary. One of the countries is uh, an alien country on a different planet called Asgard. Uh, and uh, another country is in Africa and it's hidden for everybody called Wakanda. So uh, I'll use this countries, Asgard and Wakanda, as examples of uh, currencies or countries in which we don't have any data, we have very little data. So we're going to try to predict using very little data, uh, you know, to see if we can essentially capture so I'll have only a few data points for these countries. I will assume that uh, Wakanda, which has a Wakandan dollar, according to Margul, uh, is a frugal country in which uh, you know there are a lot of um, basically there, there's a sound fiscal policy, interest rates are low. And in Asgard, I'll assume that uh, they have uh, free spending ways and the interest rates are very high. So we'll see if we can put a couple of data points to each and then reproduce the whole shape of the um, uh, of the drift as a function uh, of, of the initial rate level, even though we don't have the data for most of the straight levels, right? We will discover that this very simple uh, machine learning approach with a feed forward neural network is sufficient to be able to essentially take a data point, put it in the context of all of the other data points and basically say, hey, this data point is higher than the average. So I'm just going to assume the same shape uh, of the drift as for a lot of currencies because I don't have the data, but I'm going to shift it up, right? Which is exactly what you want to happen, right? So. So, uh, so let me, uh, you know, go, go through that, right? So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go by uh, one economy model, right? I'm going to run the example. So let me just close uh, the, uh, actually I already closed the images, I guess, uh, so I'm fine. Uh, one moment. So this is just uh, some statistics is printed, right? Okay, so uh, what do we see here? So uh, we see that uh, with this data, you know, we got um, uh, essentially linear. Uh, so this line is exactly the line that we expected to get and the shape of this point is exactly, um, uh, uh, so the, sorry, the shape of this regression produced. So basically blue are the, are the, is the data that we generated using hollow white model for one economy. Uh, and we put it in buckets, and then we passed it to um, uh, we passed it to the model. And uh, this model was able to uh, generate uh, 
a line that goes through this data. We can do the same without bucketing, right? So the difference here is that uh, when you bucket, you normalize uh, essentially the number of uh, points, right? So in other words, you protect yourself against some uh, initial points being better represented than others, right? So uh, as you see here, the data is more uniform. Here, the data is more clumped, right? So what happens here, because of the, again, this is not real data, but real data looks similar. I generated the data using random numbers and it had clumps because that's how random numbers look, right? So just here, it, no points fell here, but a lot of points fell here. Nevertheless, as you can see, you know, we're getting pretty close uh, you know, results here. So this will maybe looks a little bit better, but the key thing is that this is a straight line, which has exactly the right slope in exactly the right position in intercept. Uh, produced by uh, sum of 64 sigmoid functions, and this would not happen randomly, right? So sigmoids would not add up to, to, to the correct answer, just random, right? So, so, that, so far so good, right, it works. Okay, now let's look at the two economy model, right? So, uh, so with the two economy model, uh, first of all, uh, you know, we can just say, okay, so I'm going to look at two economy model, but I'm not going to differentiate by currency. I'm going to just put all of the data together. Uh, let's see. Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, this, uh, uh, okay. I apologize. I thought the committed the data file for that. Okay, so never mind. Uh, I was not going to run it actually, but but uh, but uh, and I will not run it. Uh, I thought I had the data file here, right? So uh, so basically uh, here with the two economy, right? So I'm I'm getting this, right? And um, uh, let me just um, uh, one second. Uh, I'm going to run it by rate and by country, right? So it's, uh, so basically, again, so the difference here is that uh, I'm either using buckets, so I'm using the um, uh, uh, I'm using the um, uh, the uh, all of the points, right? So the, so this is with buckets, all of the points. Okay, so uh, so here's the thing, right? So let's look at uh, let's just delete it, uh, delete all of these plots, right? And uh, look, for example, at this, right? So I'm going to look at um, uh, I'm going to look at um, uh, currency one, right? So let's run for currency one. Okay. So uh, let me see here. Actually, one second. So this is okay. Currency one, right? Okay. So this is um, this is the data for just this currency. Right, and this is the data for all currencies. Let's go to currency two. Right. Okay, so let me just put this in the context. Right, so this chart is where there is data for currency one only plotted. So the points is data just for currency one. And the line is the, so so essentially this is where we have the data, right? So, so the objective of machine learning is to put the line through the points, right? So the, it's going to be the mean. Uh, uh, so so this is buckets, right? So this blue, blue, blue points represent simple statistics approach to computing the regression. The way this works is that I'm giving, I'm taking the data just for this one currency. I'm taking uh, of all of the points for this currency. I'm taking for the let's say interest rate that fell let's say between four percent and five percent. This is the mean of all of these rates. For interest rates between five and six percent, uh, there's no point, right? So 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 no no points for this currency fell between five and six. Right, but there is uh, there are points that fell between six and seven, right? So that's the mean of where it did end, ended up, right? So all of the points for which the initial rate was in the bucket between let's say six and seven, that's the mean of where it ended up. So if I have enough data, this will be the same line as uh, uh, you know we, we were observing previously with the one economy. The problem is that with one economy, we had essentially data set that has all of the data from all of the fifty currencies. Here we have two economies and we don't know which is which. So we can only use the data for one currency. We, we cannot combine this data with other currencies without knowing which currencies are similar and which currencies are dissimilar. So is this just data for one currency? There is very little data. Okay, so this is currency one, right? With the data for this currency. And this is currency two with the data for this currency. Now, interesting question is that, well, how does it know, right? That 
with these three points only here, that the line goes like this way. It has a slope. How does it know that when there are points here, that the line goes here and has the slope? So in other words, how does the model, and this is a one hot encoded feed forward network. How does it know what the answer is here? Because there's no data, right? So, you know, if the data was evenly distributed, we would interpolate, but it's extrapolation, right? So you don't know where it goes here. You don't know where it goes there. In fact, here, if you had to extrapolate, you would probably put it like a lot more flat. Now, the answer is that it learned which currencies are similar and which are dissimilar and used that through unsupervised learning. So what's, what happens here is that uh, this is the rate of fall currency and this is the rate of fall currency, right? So basically uh, the data points um, here, they are from currencies which are odd, right? Currency one, currency two, currency three. So it goes through, goes through these points. And this, you know, so, you know, it, this is not a cloud of points that just doesn't have a structure. This is just two lines, right? So if, if you had more data, uh, then uh, we would see that there is one line for odd currencies, another line for, for even currencies. So our model was able to discover which is which, right? So, and if you look then at what the answer is supposed to be, you see that that's exactly what where it converges. So that's very encouraging, uh, uh, very encouraging uh, result for us. So any question, this, this is a critical result that proves that the model works. Uh, do you have any questions so far? You know, if you do, please put them in the chat. Uh, I'm looking at the chat and my colleagues will, uh, you know, help me if, uh, if I miss a message. Any questions? And also, of course, you can unmute yourself and ask. Okay, so uh, let's continue. Now, let's look at the, so this was synthetic data right, that from one and two economies and it worked exactly as expected. Now, let's look at uh, real data, right? And at real data, um, you know, we can look at, um, uh, let's say, uh, you know, OECD, we can look at bucket and country, right? And uh, so this is bucketed data, right? So there are two ways to run the model. One is uh, to run, um, one is to bucket the data, which essentially normalizes and equilibrates uh, how many pay points you have on each bucket. And it, the other one is to run with raw data. Uh, and, you know, both of these methods are valid, you know, some, some of them are better than others, um, uh, you know, in some situations, but essentially in our arsenal, the, both methods should exist, depending on what, what asset class you're applying it to, one can work better than the other. All right, so now let's look at this, right? So this is the data for Chile, it's just, you know, one of the countries that we selected randomly. And uh, if you look at um, what's happening here, right? Basically, uh, these points are from all currencies, right? So it says data all, right? So it's not just for Chile. Uh, it has, you know, pretty wide distribution because there are some currencies which rates are low, there are some currencies which rates are high. And even if the initial rate is the same, like 15%, in some currencies, initial rate may be 15% and short rate would drop almost to zero uh, after five years. In some countries that may be, uh, you know, 15%, it will go still, you know, at 15%. So this distribution is so wide just because the, you know, if there was a single set of collaboration parameters, if all of the countries were the same and had the same race dynamics, it would be a lot more narrow. So this is a combination of two things. First of all, natural randomness in where the race goes, volatility, right? And, and the other one is the variation of uh, properties of interest rate dynamics across countries. Now, the thing is that this is the data for Chile, right? So as you see here, the data set that we have only has uh, you know, a limited number of data points for Chile because uh, there's only a short time period and we need uh, this um, you know, five years of data and it's a little bit longer than five years. So there are only a few points here. Right? So each of these points is a monthly point. So you see that we hit the points that we you know, wanted to hit, right? If we had conventional statistics, we would just say, well, you know, I'm going to extrapolate it here like this. I'm going to extrapolate it here, like, I don't know how, because, you know, there's a big variation. So my point is that if we use traditional calibration, we would not be able to calibrate. That's why this problem of drift in real world measure is so complex and has not been solved for 30 years before machine learning. Because essentially statistical, uh, traditional statistics just gives up, right? So you look at this data, you know, say, well, I don't know, you know, like what's the, what's the, you know, value at 20%. It's probably, I would extrapolate it. Like if I was, you know, statistician didn't have machine learning, didn't have any other data, I would say, well, I'll extrapolate it flush. It's probably like here. But in fact, it's here. And the reason it's here is because basically what it does is the following. It says, I'm going to use the data that we have here and match it, but 
I was going to use the overall shape of the entire distribution to extrapolate properly. Okay, so that's one example. Now, second example um, is uh, rather, you know, kind of the same thing that you get. Uh, we're going to choose neuro different currencies. For example, we can choose Japan. Uh, if you pass not buckets, but rays, right? So the difference again is that you pass all points or you equilibrate and, you know, basically uh, uh, pick uh, the same fraction of number of points in each bucket. So, uh, you know, so that's the, uh, uh, that's the second example with Japan. So, which, uh, you know, it has more data. So it's going to run a little bit longer, uh, as you can see. So again, uh, this is Japan, right? Well, it, as it happens, again, we see a data set which is public, which is why we're using it, but it's very limited. So it only had data for Japan uh, in this time period with the rates very low. The question is, well, uh, how do we know what will happen when the rates are high in Japan? We don't have any data. So that's all of the data we have. If this data we just have foreign currency, I would say, well, okay, let's assume it's flat and you know and, and be done with it because we really can't do, can't do anything else. So what it did again is that it basically said, okay, so Japan is here. Uh, so I'm going to put it to match this data that we do have available, but I'm going to follow the rest of the currencies because I don't know. So so that's basically proves uh, you know that the model works on real data as, as well as on the synthetic data. And just you know for a little bit of fun, right? So so let's see what we can do with the imaginary currencies. Okay, so what we did here is that we took just a few points uh, for Asgard and for Wakanda, which are imaginary countries, and combined it with the data set that we already had. So uh, so this thing is just there are literally just a few points there. And uh, what we're getting is that um, uh, they still create a difference, right? So so this is uh, uh, this is um, actually one second. So let me, let me just delete. Um, Close this point spread because this viewer is really inconvenient uh, when when it exceeds the number of uh, when it exceeds the number of uh, data points that uh, sorry when, when it exceeds the number of slots that you have then it's very hard to get to the ones that you want so so I've closed it uh, and uh, I'm going to back, go back to ACD and generate it by bucket uh, just so we have a reference point right so this is the data for all of the currencies. And so this is the rate for all of the currencies. Now I'm going to go and uh, look at Asgard, which is this data for all of the other currencies plus a, four, a few points for Asgard, right? Which is, uh, uh, you know, which are generated. Okay, so as you see here, uh, average, this is quote unquote like model for the, you know, for the average currency, right? And it's smooth because there's a lot of data. This is the model for Asgard. It's not as smooth. Actually, it would look better if I trained for longer, but I didn't want to run very long time. Okay, so why is it higher? The reason it's higher is because we have a few data points, right? So basically it said, okay, well, I only know this data. So I'm going to know that, you know, it basically flattens here. It, you know, goes goes there, right? So, so now it's, it basically adjusted where it's positioned relative to the cloud of points based on this data being higher than average. And uh, if I'm going to go and, uh, you know, choose uh, the other imaginary currency, which has a different set of data, we'll see that uh, it does the same thing, but based on, on that data. Same thing, right? So, so it positioned it differently relative to the data and it, it put it through the through its data points. So you see that these data points are different levels. So I have, a few data points for this currency, so I'm making different predictions, right? But it preserves the overall shape based on you know all of the currencies. All right, so uh, so with that, uh, I think that um, uh, uh, we should probably move on to to um, uh, to the generator models. We have a lot fewer slides, so hopefully we'll not run out of time. So. At this point, uh, you know, we finished uh, the regression models. We're going to generate them now. So I'd like to take a very short break and ask if there are any questions uh, about regression models or this particular calculation. Uh, by the way, all of it is on GitHub, so you can clone the repository and run the model for yourself, as well as experiment. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to run out of time today, but uh, I, I one experiment that I highly recommend is just reducing the number of neurons. So you can see that if if, new, if there's only one neuron instead of 64, you just get the whatever the activation function you put because it should be essentially, you know, using, uh, it's almost like using, let's say, just constant and linear, you know, for your fit, right? So so, so that's what you're gonna get. So, so then you can see exactly as, uh, you know, increasing the number of neurons makes the fit more sophisticated and the model behaves better and better as you increase the number of neurons. That's a good experiment to run. 
so any questions, uh, comments, uh, anybody tried to running it right now? Uh, uh, you know, please, please let me know if you were succeeded. Everybody's good. All right, perfect. Okay, so with that, uh, let's now switch to um, uh, let's now switch to uh, the next topic, uh, which is the uh, um, uh, uh, which is the uh, uh, generating models. So let me go and open the slides. One second. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Can you see the screen? Yeah. All good. Okay. All right. So, second part: generating models. Um, first of all, uh, again, regression models. Which uh, you know we discussed just finished discussing. Uh, they're not just classifiers; they also include regression models. But the key thing about them is that they cannot generate new samples. And uh, when that happens, uh, we still need an additional model to generate risk factor samples, right? So in other words, if our objective is to find the replacement to historical simulation or Monte Carlo simulation for risk, then discriminative models, and you know specifically regression models, do not. Do the whole job, right? So, in other words, uh, you know, they only do part of the job. Uh, you computed volatility, you computed the drift, you compute, you know, you can use them to estimate parameters of your interest rate dynamics in a very sophisticated way. But you still need to estimate parameters of something, right? So, you estimate the drift or the mean, uh, you know, mean rate uh, given today's rate, or the, you know, the, the basically the mean and the volatility, mean and standard deviation, and any other parameters. Uh, of your probability distribution of future rates, in order to generate risk factor samples, which is what you need to do to model risk, you have to use another model. You have to plug these results into another model, which will use to generate risk factor samples. And with that, we're back to parametric models, Monte Carlo, all of the various um, uh, you know criticism that was leveled at that, where basically multiple banks were doing uh, studies, uh, you know, uh, basically computing risk on the same reference portfolio and finding very different uh, answers. So it's undesirable, right? So, the, well, the generated models is the answer because generated models can generate new risk factor samples with the same probability distribution as training data. So for the generator model, you pass it pairs of today's rate and the rate in five years. Then after it's trained, you can say, tell it what today's rate is and it will generate random samples of the rate in five years, which are drawn from the same probability distribution as um, uh, you know, the data that is trained, the model is trained on. So a generative model is a full replacement for historical or Monte Carlo simulation. Whereas a regression model is just a way to, ex ex to estimate parameters of something that you used to simulate. And that's why a generative model is uh, a complete solution while regression models is a partial solution. They're also, of course, harder to build, but it's worth the effort. Okay, so some of the best known neural network architectures are generative, including uh, general generative adversarial networks, which is the best way to do image recognition, variational autoencoders, uh, restricted Boltzmann machines, which is what we will study today, and also something called deep belief networks, which are stacks of RBMs. So we'll focus on RBM, uh, on a single RBM, uh, because it's uh, easy to understand, it's easy to train, it's relatively fast. Uh, and also because uh, scarce data, which we don't have a lot of data here, it may be a, a challenge for more complex model architectures. Now, the practical problem we have today is uh, that we want to build a generated model that we um, uh, show that generates risk factor samples that are consistent with the data used in this training. And we will work with both synthetic training data and with real world data from OECD and data set. First of all, model construction, right? So um, 
this is a slide from yesterday. So just uh, I wanted to recall, uh, and that's why I put it in today's presentation as well. So modal properties are determined uh, by the, for machine learning, modal properties are determined by the choice of state variables. Uh, we don't have stochastic risk drivers to think of because we don't have any SDE. So the state variables, excuse me, is what uh, defines what the model is. And we will define a model such that it's Markovian and stationary in the state variable. In this case, our probability uh, density that, that, uh, that our model will learn is a function of the initial state, final state, and the difference in time. Okay, now, a generated model trained on a data set of historical pairs with time shift, right, with time lag. So let's say short rate today, short rate after five years, or short and term rate today and the same pair after five years, or all of the forward rates today versus all of the forward rates in five years. So once you train the model to that, it can generate new samples from the joint probability distribution of whatever your training data is, which is basically both the current rates and the new rates. So if uh, these are these factors at model over chain and these are these factors at model horizon, then generating model can be used in place of historical or Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, what we need for the simulation, however, is a distribution that's conditional to these risk factor values, right? So in other words, uh, you know, we don't want the model to generate the samples of future rates and also various rates today. Why? Well, because we know what the rate today is, right? So, you know, we don't have to simulate random when we're doing risk. Uh, we're not interested in simulating scenarios of what today's rates could be because we know what they are, right? So, so you know, basically the, these are the rates today. We can uh, look at the data feed and uh, see what they are. So we're not interested. So, so the, the model can generate uh, various potential values of risk factors today, but we're not interested. What we're interested in is the conditional probability distribution, not to be confused, by the way, with Bayesian likelihood, it's not the same thing here. Uh, so it's conditional probability distribution. If uh, today's rates are whatever they are, what are the probabilities of future rates? However, you know, not to be deterred, uh, we can calculate this conditional probability distribution from the joint distribution analytically or numerically. And so uh, a lot of models actually allow analytical calculation of that. Uh, if, if we don't, then we can generate enough samples from the joint distribution and just use budgeting, right? So the same thing as we used to analyze historical data, we generate a lot of samples, then samples which happen to match with a certain precision today's interest rates, we're just going to take these samples and, and throw out all of the others. And we will get exactly the right uh, answer this way. Okay, now the model uh, will be calibrated at nodes which are whole multiples of its calibration of the calibration horizon. And between the nodes, any suitable stochastic interpolation method can be used, for example, Brownian bridge, right? So we're going to choose our horizon, for example, two years or five years. Uh, two years would be you know, more suitable if you're looking at medium horizons. Five years would be more suitable if you're looking at, let's say, 30 or 50 year horizon, which is, you need, uh, which is something you need to do for things like limits or insurance. Uh, insurance, in fact, is even uh, longer than 30 years uh, when you're computing insurance reserves. So uh, anything within this model horizon, you can interpolate. And today we'll use five years because longer calibration horizon makes it kind of a lot of things just stand out more and easier to uh, use for the workshop. But in production, you know, it, it could be, you know, I think two years for production is probably more suitable because you don't want to interpolate over, you know, a very long period. But I'm using five, five years uh, for the workshop because uh, it just makes the results uh, kind of, you know, more clear in the chart. Okay, so now if we're simulating the model for this uh, time horizon, so if, if we're calibrating the model rather for this time horizon tau, uh, what do we do when we need risk factor samples for longer time horizon. Okay, so in this case, we need to perform integration. So if we use the notation that uh, risk factors at n multiples will basically tau times n, right? So for example, if n is equal to two and uh, tau is equal to five years, that's gonna be 10 years. So we're going to uh, use the model to calculate uh, or draw samples rather for risk factors, not only at the single collaboration horizon, like two or five years, but it's twice the horizon, three times the horizon, four times the horizon, and so on. And then between we'll interpolate. And I'm going to use this notation of uh, P and M uh, of uh, uh, conditional probability of N uh, with respect to M. And I'm going to drop the second uh, digit when it's uh, different by one, right? So from one to zero, I'm just going to say P1. 
So important things here to keep in mind is that for n, which is very high, much higher than m, the initial state will be forgotten and the result will only depend on the first variable. It's very really easy to understand why. So let's suppose that uh, we have some interest rates today. Do we really care? I mean, in terms of you know what the probability is, what the rates were 100 years ago? We don't, right? So in other words, uh, it's something that was in ancient history. Uh, it doesn't matter if, let's say, 100 years ago, uh, you know, in 1920, the interest rates were very low, very high. In fact, uh, you know, some of these markets didn't even exist. We couldn't answer that question. Uh, in fact, normally, uh, you know, the rates get forgotten after about 10 years, right? So 10 or 15 years, you almost forget about the initial state, right? So, so you don't care what the rates were. Uh, it's ancient history. It doesn't depend on today's probability. So this thing uh, basically forgets about the initial state after a while. But before it did, you know, before it does, uh, it's important. Okay, so uh, now with Monte Carlo, um, uh, we need stochastic differential equation, which will integrate from uh, zero to time t, right? So we solve it. Uh, sometimes there are highly priced analytical solutions, which make things fast. Uh, when you don't, you can simulate it uh, with Monte Carlo. Uh, and uh, the uh, rather, you know, simulate it directly versus, for example, for Colin White model, uh, there is an analytical solution, so you can just draw samples using a formula. Uh, so it's not only the, the solution for pricing, but also it makes it faster for you to draw samples. When they don't exist, you have to simulate random numbers, you have to plug into the equ equation. Okay, so with machine learning, we don't have the stochastic differential equation. We have nothing to integrate to solve. And our representation is numerical and uh, is not a simple formula. However, not to be uh, you know, worried here, it's actually very easy to overcome because uh, we can write this as an integral over low intermediate states, right? So, so imagine you started, uh, uh, I hope you can see my camera, right? So uh, imagine you started from here, right? And you go here, and then you end up where, you know, at the end in some other state. So essentially your probability of getting from here to the end is the sum or integral over all prim 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 intermediate, uh, over all intermediate states with the product of probabilities, right? So it's probability of getting from here to here, then from here to there, uh, and it's integrated over all these intermediate states. So that's the integral, and it's kind of a scary integral because uh, it's, uh, the, the, you know, the, this integral is, um, if you have five periods, it's, a, you know, it's basically a fifth uh, uh, order integral. Uh, and of course, it's very difficult to compute numerically. However, with the generative model, we don't have to because we can simply call it in sequence, right? So we can use uh, what's called a Markov chain approach, uh, which tends to uh, generally think, make things very easy in math. Uh, so you generate your first sample, then use it as the input to the next sample, use it as the input to the next sample. So instead of uh, taking a five dimensional uh, of order integral, uh, you simply call your model five times, which is very simple and easy. So, and that's what will get you exactly where you wanna be. So, uh, however, what's important, and I'm going to use this um, uh, uh, symbol here to, to, to indicate that I'm calling the model in sequence as a Markov chain. So uh, the key thing here to remember, which is something we covered already in the previous um, uh, session yesterday, is that uh, when we have state variables, which are like um, uh, uh, short rate models, uh, which we call term rate models because uh, the drivers are for the short rate, but the state variables are for the short end term rate for two factors, two term rates for three factors and so forth. So if the model has this style, uh, then uh, we just, you know, basically it's convolution with itself, right? So we, we use the same generating model in sequence. So this model P1, it gets us from today to the next two years. It's called P1 because, uh, I don't know, maybe I should have called it P0. If you're a Python Pike program, it would have been called zero because it's basically the first index, right? So uh, it gets us from today to the next two years, the two, two years from now. If you want to go to four years, you just do it twice. And it's the same model, same model with the same probability. So you apply the model twice, it's four years, a prime model three times is six years and so forth. And it's the same model. The reason is that this state variables here are positioned relative to zero, the same way as these state variables are positioned relative to the future point. They slide forward with you, right? Okay, with the forward rate model, these probabilities are different. You calibrate them separately and you apply them in sequence is, uh, you know, N, you know, three, four, two, one, right? And these probabilities are essentially 
what happens with the with the forward rate? So the last one, which is P1, is what happens to the forward rate which fixes in two years between now and the fixing. This one is what happens with the forward rate which fixes in four years over the next two years, right? So so your today's state is for, is fixing is four years from now. You're trying to estimate uh, or draw samples of risk factors for the forward rate for the future point in time, two years from now, when it's still two years remaining until the fixing. Next one is you start at minus six years. It's like countdown to fixing, right? So you start at minus six, you go to minus four. This one gets you from minus four to minus two. This one gets you from minus two to, to zero. And after that, the rate is fixed and doesn't change anymore. And you can calibrate them separately, right? So in other words, uh, each one of them uh, is um, uh, each one of them is the uh, rate over two years. You calibrate them separately, and then you use them together. Uh, any questions about this? That's actually a very key distinction here. The two different models, uh, model styles. Okay. So uh, now the uh, with that uh, we're done with. Um, reviewing of how the model is constructed, and we're going to go to neural network architecture. Okay, so we're going to discuss uh, a specific generative model, which is the restricted Boltzmann machine. Uh, it's a very old uh, and very simple um, uh, neural network. However, uh, it, it is actually a highly respected you know, way to build more complex neural networks. So it's not, you know, it's not an outdated technology by any means. It's, it's really is a building block of something called deep belief uh, nets, which are which are uh, you know extremely powerful. Uh, however, here we just don't have the data for this deep belief nets, uh, and really one RBM, uh, you know, is uh, something that um, perhaps be more prudent because again, Occam's razor, you know, you only invoke complexity and uh, you use something very complex when the simple thing doesn't work. The simple thing uh, here happens to just work very well. So we're just going to stay with RBM, but both for the purposes of the workshop and also because uh, because we don't want, want, want the training to, to take a day. Uh, and also because, uh, you know, this seems to be actually a very well, um, uh, very successful model uh, in its own right. So uh, this model is organized as follows. Uh, binary neurons are organized in hidden visible layers, right? So the difference between this network and the feed forward network that we've uh, used uh, earlier is that these neurons are binary, right? So uh, with the feed forward network, the, 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 the neurons were accepting a continuous input and producing a continuous output. These neurons are binary. They either fire or they don't, right? So they're actually kind of a little bit more like the human brain neurons, right? So there are some, uh, there's some threshold, right? So it's actually, they, they do, uh, sorry, correction. They do actually accept a continuous input, but they fire, but, but the value is either zero or one. So once you once the once the stimulus exceeds certain threshold, uh, which is called a bias, uh, then they fire and they become one, and then uh, the value of one then is added up to the bias at the next step. Okay, so so now here is uh, each hidden neuron is connected to every visible neuron and vice versa, but the name restricted means that they're not connecting to each other. So uh, in this neural network neurons within each layer are not connected. However, they're connected between the two layers. And that's what makes it easy to train and uh, makes it possible uh, to use the algorithm called construct contrastive divergence, uh, because otherwise the algorithm would simply not work and they would be very slow. So, uh, you know, and, and, and the key thing here is that um, uh, it, this neural network is a little bit different uh, then the traditional neural network, you know, the people usually learn uh, feed forward networks first. In fact, uh, the perceptron, uh, which is essentially the very first one layer neural network uh, was in fact some hardware with wires. Uh, and uh, it's kind of the grand daddy of all neural networks. So when people learn neural networks, they usually start from feed forward neural networks. So, so the thing is, uh, then you kind of get used to a certain way of thinking of, about how it works. And that's really different here. In the feed-forward neural network, you have, and that's the charts, uh, you know, that, that's the diagrams that we've been looking at yesterday. Uh, you essentially have inputs on the left, you have outputs on the right and hidden layers in the middle. Uh, so the input comes from one end and the output comes out from the other end. In uh, RBM, it's uh, completely different. So the inputs are the outputs are actually are mapped to the same layer. So this uh, network uh, essentially, uh, you know, circles back, right? So, so, so basically there's a hidden layer and uh, there's the input, which is x of t, right? So the, our input is the state variable today. 
uh, output is uh, samples of the state variable two years from now or five years from now. In the feed forward neural network, this, the output would be mapped to a separate layer, which will be on a, would, would have been on the other side. But here it's part of the same layer. And uh, that's absolutely fine because uh, what we'll get is, the, is this uh, drawing distribution. And then we're just going to condition, compute conditional on this value uh, numerically or analytically. So it will not really cause any problems for us uh, rather than you know, minor additional steps that we need to do. Uh, but really from the neural network perspective, uh, the inputs and the outputs, right? So in a traditional feed forward network, you have the input and the output, which are distinct on other ends, opposite ends. So here it just says, well, there are some things of which there is a joint distribution. You don't really care which is which. In fact, uh, you can look at today's rates and say, uh, what is the probability that this rates came, like what is the pro pro given today's rate? Not only you can answer th the question about what's the probability of the race five years from now, you can also ask, ask the question, what is the probability that the race were at a certain level five years ago, right? Because it's completely symmetric. It basically, basically it doesn't have the arrow of time. You can use it to answer the question that given to the race, what the race were. And of course, in financial markets, it's kind of a ridiculous question because uh, basically, you know, it, it, as it is, but in things like, uh, for example, uh, material science, or we'd be looking at the catastrophic failures and so forth. It's actually a very important question. Like, you know, given that, given how your, you know, blade of uh, whatever blade of, uh, of the aircraft engine failed, right? The question is like, what, what happened before? It's actually a very important question. So you can use, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, different era of time for, to answer this question. So basically how some disaster happened, like what led to it when, 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 when do you, you have no data. All right, so uh, now if, if we don't have the currency, right? So then this, we have bipartite mapping uh, and this bipartite mapping is uh, from uh, interest rates today to interest rates five years from now. Uh, when there's also currency is tripartite mapping, right? There are also all on the same layer interest rates today, interest rates five years from now, and the currency. Why there are four, right? Well, because the currency doesn't change, right? So over the next five years, the currency will stay the same, hopefully. Uh, and uh, what you have here is the old state variable interest rate with several interest rates, the new state variable after a period of time in the currency of which there is only one because it's the same currency today and five years from now. So you split your input layer into three parts. Two of them go to continuous variables and uh, fourth one goes to, um, uh, and the third one, sorry, uh, goes to the currency. Okay, now uh, is um, we already you know, discussed the, uh, this neurons of RBM I binary. However, interest rates are continuous. So how do you map them? Well, what you do is you map them using, um, you map them using essentially binary bits. In fact, uh, you know, our neural networks, uh, machine learning in general, or specifically RBM is so good at learning these relationships that you really don't need, uh, in words, uh, uh, you know, even though with scarce data, uh, uh, you know, you might try actually represent it in a different basis, right? So in other words, instead of representing as basically, a, is a, uh, you take, what, what, what we're doing here is that we're taking the interest rate and then mapping it to, a binary representation in a particular range. So it's, for example, say we're not going to represent the rate as less than minus 5% because it cannot happen. And more than let's say 30% because it's not a real, relevant data point. That's hyperinflation and the model would not apply anyway. So I'm going to take this finite interval and represent the position within that interval as a binary number. So there will be essentially discrete points where the race could fall. But with enough registers, you can make it as refined as you'd like. So yes, so there is a discrete step but if you have 16, uh, you know, you have <clears throat> double number in the computer also, you know, is represented as a binary somewhere, but it just has so many uh, bits in it that is uh, all practical purposes is continuous. Same thing here. You probably don't need as many bits because if you're talking about uh, a model that pro projects the rates for 30 years, you probably don't really care uh, or cannot really calibrate it. Uh, so it distinguishes between, uh, let's say interest rates of 2% and 2.2%. Uh, so it's really this distribution is very broad and uh, you know you don't care if it's you know as you can the distribution is so broad you can discretize it uh, with very few uh, points but on the other hand you know it's also really not very costly to add not a lot of registers but the key thing here is that uh, we do not um, make an attempt to make this mapping more linear or more intuitive because uh, maybe it will be more intuitive to us but for machine learning it's the same thing 
uh, when you have image recognition, we're not trying to say, well, let's go in and code, you know, the face, right? Machine learning does it for you, right? So basically machine learning for images, it takes pixels, which lack an intuitive connection to what's in the image, and it figures it out. Here, it takes this ones and zeros, which lacks an intuitive connection, you know, to the value of the rate, and it figures it out. So we should not make the mistake of uh, trying to make it intuitive for the neural network, where all we're doing is trying to make it intuitive for ourselves. However, there are some ways to reduce kind of the amount of inference that the network has to do. So uh, it only makes you know it only makes sense when there's very scarce data, which is the case for finance. So I wouldn't close the possibility that you can make a better representation. In fact, uh, uh, my quarter, Alexei and I, uh, you know, who, who, who uh, were writing basically a paper based on some of these examples. Uh, so we're going to look into this, but it's not necessary. And that's not what we're doing today. And of course, the currencies are using the same one-hot encoding uh, because, as we discussed uh, yesterday, uh, any other encoding will create bias because you essentially would say that one currency is closer to uh, to another currency than to the rest. So with one hot, you're not making any, uh, it's pure unsupervised learning. You're not making any existing, you're not basically creating any pre-existing notions of, uh, of uh, which currencies are similar. And uh, the way that RBM works uh, is that you seed the hidden layer with random numbers. Then you do the iteration where you activate the visible layer based on the biases of the hidden layer. Then you do hidden again, then you, and the circle shows that you repeat this. Uh, multiple times, uh, and uh, then eventually you get the answers. So that's how, like, it, I, I'm not describing how the network is trained. That's actually using um, a contrastive divergence algorithm by Hitman, and uh, you know you need probably an hour to just a whole lecture to explain how it works. And that's not the purpose because this workshop is about how to use these models for finance as opposed to how to build them. For that, there are plenty of other workshops. So I'm just talking about how to generate samples from it. And the way you generate samples is by seeding random numbers, then iterating between these layers. And this process is called thermalization. Essentially, it gives something which comes from physics. And the idea is that, uh, that uh, uh, you're essentially using, um, uh, using um, uh, Brownian motion, more or less, you know, to draw from a probability distribution. Uh, and uh, normally, about 1,000 iterations is perfectly fine. Uh, and uh, then out of that, you get basically a sample for both today's rate and the future rate. And you can do two things with it. Either you can do that and then just uh, throw away all of the samples at the end that, uh, you know, for which today's rate is not what it actually is. Or you can do it at each step, right? What, what, what you can do is that uh, you can make it a little bit more effective by um, essentially every time that you go through this iteration, you reset this left part to whatever the state is today. And this will, uh, you can show that this will produce the correct conditional distribution for the future state. All right, so uh, so let me uh, now the uh, you know now, now that we've um, uh, gone through this, uh, so uh, so let me um, uh, go through the code and then we'll look at some examples. Even though, as I mentioned, uh, you know, to get something that's not garbage, uh, you need to wait a little bit longer. So we're going to run um, uh, we're going to run uh, through um, uh, some simple examples, which we will not necessarily get a great looking answer. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, open um, uh, a machine on which I ran them in advance, and uh, uh, we'll be able to look at the uh, at the figures that uh, that were generated by the code. Any questions so far uh, about any uh, of this uh, material before we go to the code? Okay. So uh, so with that, let me go to the source code. <clears throat> There are a couple of uh, uh, you know classes here, um, so uh, so let me just go through them uh, through a simple class. Uh, and uh, was, it, uh, was it here? Just this runs. Uh, okay. All right. So. Um,
Okay, so yeah, just give me little, one second here. Uh, I think I have a better. Uh, this is the example from the runs. Um, uh, I'm just going to look at. Um, uh, I'm going to open uh, a simpler example that doesn't have a lot of. So, so basically, this example that I just opened, um, that's what we use to generate the uh, data, but it also has a lot of code uh, that saves various settings uh, because uh, when you're doing a long run, um, uh, you know, we, we say we're saving a lot more data than we're doing with the short run because you cannot interactively go and look at it. So, uh, let me just, um, just bear with me just for one second. I'm going to open uh, perhaps a little bit uh, more convenient. Um, uh, another class from which will be easier to look at this. Uh, one second. Is the is the um, uh, oh I found it that's fine okay uh, all right open writing tree okay Should be in run uh, I found runs it, yeah. folder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found it. Okay, there it is. All right, so um, so let me just go. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I stopped sharing while I was looking for the file. I'm sorry. All right, so you can see it now, right? So this is a class short rate RBM, right? So it's the simplest example. Uh, and again, so it's organized uh, uh, with uh, settings uh, where you know there are this uh, settings for input data. There are also things like learning rate and so forth. Uh, also, there is skip samples and take samples. Uh, and the reason we have that is because uh, when we generate, we don't need it for historical data. But when we generate, um, when we uh, when we uh, train it on simulated data, uh, you want to wait a little bit and not take uh, the initial samples because um, you want it to equilibrate and basically whatever this random starting points uh, we generated, uh, want the yield curve to equilibrate. And uh, because, you know, we, we start from a random point, which is not necessarily an initial point. And then we wait a little bit until the yield curve comes to whatever the model is predicting. Uh, and then we start taking the samples. So that's why that, that's why is there so and uh, basically there is a essentially binary conversion so this is a function that encodes the rate into a binary register uh, and uh, the function uh, basically the training function is extremely simple uh, and we just call it this uh, function scikit learn uh, uh, you know called Bernoulli RBM uh, and uh, uh, you know th there are some parallel implementations even though scikit learn actually has a non-parallel uh, version uh, and uh, it takes the seed because uh, you know the random seed um, that you're using determines your answers. Uh, it takes the number of components, which is the size of the hidden layer. Uh, it takes the number of iterations uh, for the training. It has the mini batch size, which is uh, given the time. Uh, I should probably not uh, uh, you know go through details. And again, you know, it, 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 as, as uh, already you know several times, said several times. And again, I wanted to you know just make sure that. Um, that is, it's not it's not that I'm lazy. I'm trying not to you know to to skip going through how this works, but it's just there is such a you know plentiful material on that. Uh, right now there are workshops, there are YouTube videos, literally, of talks and so forth. So we're just not going to go through uh, through how this function works inside. Uh, there's plenty of uh, ways to find out. So uh, we call this function. Uh, you know, there's a mini batch size. Uh, there is learning rate. Uh, so the learning rate zero means it doesn't learn. Learn learning rate as fast may uh, underfit. Uh, so you need to, to be uh, tuned, right? So just like uh, when you're building a yield curve, you need to tune. Uh, you know, the degree of smoothing. So that's a parameter that's very finicky, and uh, you know that that has to be tuned carefully. And uh, what we do have, however, here is explicit is drawing the samples, right? And there are two ways to, to get the samples, right? Actually, there are three ways. So the first way is to get the Markov chain samples. So what this does is that uh, we have a distribution, right? 
and we take the rate output and when we use it as an input and we take the rate out we use it as an input so markov chain samples that's how we actually get to um, uh, longer horizons like two and four year horizon so we make the model generate rates in two years from now is a function of today's rates then we take this value and put it back as an input and generate uh, the value two years later then two years later and so forth so essentially all we do is that we take the output so you know in the slides we saw uh, the left side and the right side the left side was raised today right side were left rates in two years from now or five years from now so what you do is that you start from today's rates and you get the rates on the right on the left and you get the rates on the right side then you move them to the left put them in what comes out on the right side is the rates four years from now you move them to the left put them in on the right you get rates six years from now and so forth and so on at some point when you do it enough times it will forget about what the initial state was and that's exactly what happens in real markets right you know the, the rates today they really don't depend on what they were you know 30 50 years ago or even 20 years ago normally uh, this memory disappears after about 10 or 15 years or even less so uh, so this essentially is uh, how you simulate over time okay so uh, another thing here is that uh, get joint samples right so that's how you get um, uh, the distribution uh, basically of all of the rates that uh, could be today and where they could go from here uh, you don't normally uh, need uh, this type of thing uh, except for very special situations uh, where you know well one of them is that uh, if using this in risk neutral measure for america monte Carlo, you need to generate points around today's points Right. So in other words, uh, when you're doing America Monte Carlo, you need to average over um, uh, you know states at some future point, and you need to generate them. So here uh, with America Monte Carlo, uh, you know when you basically doing America Monte Carlo, let's say for the price at 10 years of something that expires in 20 years, what you need to is you need to generate the states at 10 years, all the possible states, and then um, where it went in the future. In America, Monte Carlo, well, then you perform a regression, it will give you the answer. So that's uh, you know where this function could be useful, but uh, it's perhaps not as useful for a real world measure. And that's the function that's really useful for real world measure, which is conditional, right? So what it does is that it uh, basically tells you, uh, it, it, it lets you compute, um, uh, so there's an input value. So again, so this is short rate RBM. So this is one uh, dimensional. Uh, so it takes initial value of the of the rate and gives you the samples for the future value of the rate based on this given this initial value and this done is this done as uh, um, uh, you know we, we just looked at the slide right so done for thermalization so thermalization is uh, we set to 1000 essentially what you do is that uh, every time uh, you do this iteration so you send the data to the hidden layer get it back send the data to the hidden layer get it back and you do it through the uh, uh, basically function gibbs right so this rbm gibbs is the function that does it for you but every time before you call this gibbs function you reset today's values to what they are today right so gibbs sampling will change the left side and the right side so it will change today's values and it'll change the future values every time it does you set the values on the left to today and keep doing it this you can show will generate will give you the, the conditional probability exactly what you want so essentially you know that's all to it uh all of the other stuff here is just uh, scaffolding you know basically save markup chain save joints and mean and so forth right so saving basically various uh, uh parameters uh and uh with that uh we're now ready to look at the results so you know again as i mentioned um in order to get uh decent results here uh really the shortest run is probably you know about uh, you know three five minutes and you know we, we only um uh, have uh, you know limited time remaining uh in this workshop so we're going to uh, uh you know look at the results and if there's time left uh i'm going to ask everybody because i, I wanted um uh, to leave time at the end for questions and interactive session so uh if anybody wants to run rbm we can otherwise we can also do some things which are really you know that are extremely instructive which is basically changing the uh, parameters of the uh, of the feed forward network and looking how you can go from um basically just a sigmoid you know to to a full interpolation so we can do either of that we can run rbm so for now i just wanted to look uh, at the results uh and uh, discuss the results a little bit 
So uh, I'm going to open this machine, and uh, you know you can see here that basically there is a checkout of um, uh, checkout of the same repository, and uh, the way that all of the scripts are done here is that um, uh, you can see that uh, there is um, actually let me just uh, go back right. So uh, so most of the scripts here, what they do is, um, uh, for example, here uh, they pass this file parameter to the model, and then the model uses this file parameter in Python. To save the results. So what it means is that whatever you call your script, the names of the output files will have the same prefix. So I was taking advantage of this here. Uh, and uh, essentially, in order to do a run, uh, you just rename the file and run it. So this is, uh, of course, uh, you know, basically, it's, it's kind of research style software. We did not want to make this open source code on GitHub that uh, we're asking everybody to try, uh, you know, highly sophisticated piece of uh, cloud technology. So uh, we're using the cloud machine in a way that, um, you know, basically <laughs> any cloud engineer would say, don't use the cloud machines like that because basically the cloud is not about uh, creating a virtual machine in the cloud and logging into it. You're supposed to be using serverless technologies uh, and, you know, things like Kubernetes or even Fargate <coughs> in Amazon or Amazon Lambda. But this uh, workshop is not about cloud technology, right? And uh, as a quant, you know, this, uh, of course it's easier your files. So this is just a cloud machine. So I run this uh, uh, five things. So I'm going to just go over them. All right. So first of all, um, uh, this is the um, uh, model. Uh, so this is the model, uh, basically a synthetic model. Right. So our initial point uh, is um, actually, uh, let me just see. I think I have a slide on how to interpret the charts. Let me just, uh, if I do, perhaps it will help. One moment. <coughs> Uh, do I have the chat? Shut up. Okay. Um, uh, I guess I don't. It's probably another presentation. But anyway, I'll, I'll just talk through it. So, uh, so the way to interpret this chart is that um, the red point is our initial point, and the red box around it is when we're not using machine learning, but we're using conventional statistics. Uh, we just take all of the points for which the initial state, or initial uh, you know interest rates were within that box, and see what they ended up. So uh, this is the short rate, horizontal axis is the short rate. So this is a two-factor model now. Horizontal axis is the short rate. Uh, this is the long rate. So blue point here is where the rates, short rate and the and the ten-year rate. Uh, blue points represent what these rates ended up after they were initial, initially in the box. And red is the center of the box. Black circle is the mean uh, of uh, or the center of this distribution, right? The, the center of gravity of, of the result. Here, so here, this is the input historical data, right? Uh, or, or, you know, or simulated data. It's basically either, either synthetic data that we generated to make sure that our result is correct, against, you know, that we verify against something we know, or it's historical data. It's always on the left. On the right side, we have uh, RBM, generative model. We don't need the box because with machine learning, you just say, I'm going to calculate the uh, draw samples, conditional initial rate being exactly that. We only need the box here because in historical data, you never hit exactly this point, right? So in other words, uh, you know, depending on your, of course, if there are ticks, that's not the case, right? But if the rate is continuous, it never really repeated, right? So today, uh, this, there is uh, some unique set of um, interest rates, which were, if not for the ticks, right? If not for the finite increments that the financial markets have, they were never repeated before. But even with the increments, uh, thing is, uh, uh, you know, it's a lot easier to find days in the past where the rate was, let's say, within one percent of today's rate. There are more of these dates than when you say, well, it has to be like within a basic point. Then you probably won't find any points. So, the historical data or synthetic historical data, generated historical data, real historical data is analyzed as follows: you start from the rates which were in the box. And then you look at where they ended up. So the blue dot is where they ended up, the short rate and the long rate. And uh, the, red, uh, the, the black is, is, a, is the center of gravity of the distribution. So the way that we're going to, it's called the migration plot, right? So the way that we're going to estimate uh, or evaluate the quality of the model is basically by saying, okay, well, the black dot will want to, to be in the same place relative to the red dot. And then the green square, which is sometimes we draw an L up, sometimes a green square, basically the square is, is that the edge, each edge is two standard deviations. 
So we want the green squares to be similarly sized. We want the red, the, the black dot to be in the same place. And if that's the case, that means that our model works well. And uh, you can actually, uh, uh, you know, the thing here is that it's not as simple or as uh, trivial as this result may seem. Because I'm looking at initial point of 5%, right? But some of the data we'll, we'll be looking at, well, the initial point is a zero. So if you have a model like Helen White model in which the volatility is normal in the initial point is zero, it has equal probability of going to 2% or to minus 2%, more or less, right? And of course, the interest rates have now gone to minus 2%. In fact, in the United States, uh, you know, they're just flirting with, uh, with it being negative. In Europe, they are, but you know, they're not minus 2%. Uh, but there was apparently you know, some liquidity squeeze, uh, I forgot on which country, with the rent really you know, much more negative, but that just was a result of a liquidity issue rather than, um, rather than real interest rate. So, uh, so essentially, uh, you know, having the black dot properly positioned, having this, uh, uh, you know, the, these points full in a similar pattern is actually not as easy as it sounds, because that's what traditional statistical models really fail at completely, as, as we'll see in a moment. All right. So uh, now let's look at the next plot, right? Which is um, basically the USA. Right? Okay. So that's the example that I'm talking about, right? So, uh, so for the USA. Uh, you have this data uh, where uh, historically uh, it uh, basically uh, went into this kind of V-shaped, V-shaped, and uh, the reason it's V-shaped is because um, uh, in in the United States there were some time periods where the interest rates were kind of going, the yield curve was going flat, right? So there, there were some time periods where the interest rates were going up and down flat. When, it, when the interest rate curve, when the yield curve goes up and down flat that creates this line that goes diagonally, right? So this is the three month rate. This is the 10 year rate. When yield curve is moving up and down with a parallel shift flat, it, it basically has a kind of a diagonal pattern. And as you can see here, this is the zero, right? This is the X equal Y line, it's higher than this line. What it means is that the yield curve in the United States was moving up and down with a slight slope. And of course it is because today uh, the short rate is near zero, but the long rate is a few percent. So essentially it has a slope of a few percent for the, over the next you know, 10 or so years, right? And it's moving up and down flat. Okay. So uh, this side is when the short rate was at zero and the long rate was moving up. So remember before COVID, uh, the short rate, the, you know, the rate basically that you get paid in your checking account. Again, so I'm talking, um, people who live in the United States, but anybody in Europe could commiserate because you get exactly the same thing. So you look into your checking account and you have uh, you know, one cent of interest or two cents of interest because the interest rates are very low you know, for the short maturity for the money market. However, the mortgage rates are going up. So before COVID, the mortgage rates were going up, long rates. Then COVID happened, uh, central bank interfered and you know, the economies slowed down, so they fell back. So, so this uh, vertical side of the V-shape is when the long rates are moving and the short rates are staying at zero. And this is a previous period where they're moving kind of parallel. This is V-shape. Now the thing is, uh, you know, well, I, 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 basically the question is like, is a risk manager, right? Do we take it seriously? I think we don't. Because even though, you know, I had a number of discussions here where economists actually do, you know, do predict this uh, two regimes. But the thing is, as a risk manager, you're not comfortable, you know, so it has a V shape, right? So I'm going to say, well, it never gets here. You know, you, you may have a financial instrument that just happens to blow up here, right? I'm going to say that there will be no points here. I'm going to say that there will be no points here, right? You will not. So the thing is, uh, as a risk manager, what you want is a model that takes in account, into account the data for the given currency and judiciously combines it with the data for all other currencies in areas where there is not enough historical data. So if a particular scenario happened in the past and you can say, well, okay, so today's rate, let's say is uh, you know 2% and uh, 3%, there was plenty of times in the past when the rates were the same. So I have enough statistics of what happened then. Okay, fine. So you are going to just use the data for the dollar. But if the rates today are such that it never happened before, because you know, near zero rates are actually relatively recent, right? So before, you know, 20, two, two, two decades ago, nobody expected uh, United States to have near zero rates, right? Only Japan had near zero rates at that time or two or three decades ago. So, uh, 
basically, as a risk manager, you don't want to say, well, this will never happen. You don't want to say this will never happen. So you want the model to have more data, but combined with the data that you do want. OK, so that's exactly what this accomplishes, right? And the thing is uh, that maybe you know on that chart is not really completely obvious, but uh, also it's something that really, really never happened. Like for example, interest rates, uh, short rate of minus three percent or minus two percent, then RBM will not predict it. So that's a huge, hugely important property that uh, much generative model will never give you the data of the type that never happened before, and that unfortunately cannot be said for things like a stochastic equation. Uh, because with a stochastic equation, like you know, Holland White is a good example. So Holland White for mid-range rates, the vol is about normal. It's a simple equation. Everybody is using it. Well, the thing is, uh, when the rates are zero, it has high probability of rates going very, very negative, which of course is absurd. But people use it because it's such a convenient model. Otherwise, uh, so with generative machine learning model, unlike with traditional stochastic models, they will not predict something that never happened before. And it's a great thing. Now, another thing is that uh, this is the uh, ZAF, right? So, well, it's a country code. It's not a currency code. So this is South Africa. And uh, the currency is ZAR, South African RAND, right? So so this is ZAF is the three three letter ISO uh, country code for South Africa. OK, now the thing is, uh, you see that there is no data in the plot on the left. Uh, and uh, you may be alarmed, but please don't be. The reason is that South Africa never had the rates at low. Right in the entire history, uh, you know, for which the data was recorded by OECD, right? So this is a short rate one percent, long rate two percent, never happened. So we don't know, right? Now imagine that South African economy does well. Uh, you know, basically central bank is you know is interfering, uh, economy is uh, uh, is in the right shape, so the interest rates go low. What are you going to say? I'm going to say, well, I'm a risk manager. I have no data. I'm not going to basically compute risk. You can't do that, right? So what it does here is a saying, okay, well, let's combine the information from other currencies which had raised that low and also the tendency of South Africa to have high rates and very fast mean reversion to these high rates. What we get is this, right? So it's saying it started, if it starts here, the model predicts that in two years, the rates that was at 1% will go up to 8% based on the properties of this currency combined with properties of all other currencies in this area. And that probably is pretty reasonable. In fact, the rates that low are completely unlikely, right? So it's very low likelihood that it will actually happen. But of course, if most of your data is pointing to reversion toward 8%, you expect the model to here. But the key thing is that if you're using historical simulation, uh, you would not be able to do that. And if you're using Monte Carlo simulation, you would have to hugely extrapolate, which really would make the result completely a function of your assumptions rather than uh, rooted and um, uh, you know, founded and uh, um, uh, rather founded in, uh, uh, in history and uh, fundamental non subjective data. So you don't want, with historical, you just don't get the answer at all. With Monte Carlo parametric model, your answer is a function of your subjective assumption. Here, your answer is a function of, uh, well, to some extent of the model, but to much lesser extent and to much larger extent is a function of this currency's data and what happens for all of the other currencies. Right, so it's an extreme example, but I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great illustration of what, what the model does when there's no data, right? And, uh, you know, basically that's another thing here again. So basically, uh, same example, remember Asgard and Wakanda, right? So, so we assumed two different, uh, we assumed two different um, um, uh, 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 one second, Asgard, okay, what, oh, sorry. Okay. Just trying to make it bigger a little bit. Okay, so, uh, oh, wait a second, I opened UCA and what I wanted is Wakanda, right? So that's why it looks wrong. One second. Ah, okay, yeah. So, yeah, so sorry, uh, what I meant to do, it, not that it's wrong, but uh, I wanted to have the same starting points, which the USA did not. So, uh, this is the example of two currencies for which, uh, as you remember in the beginning, we covered also. So these are two imaginary currencies for countries that don't really exist. 
And we put just a few imaginary data points for these currencies, but we made them different. So we made uh, Wakanda to be uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, a lot more, um, uh, we, we put these points basically for Wakanda, we put lower interest rates in a few data points than for Asgard. And as you can see, in either case, we don't have any data that's conditional. We don't have any data points that uh, at 5% short rate, 10% long rate for either of these currencies. But elsewhere, for other interest rates, we had higher rates for Asgard than for Wakanda. And what, it, what the model did is I said, okay, well, uh, you know, this is from the red dot, Wakanda rates in two years will migrate here. Asgard rates will migrate here. It's just slightly different um, uh, size here. So, so, uh, so the, um, uh, this is actually the same point, right? So it's five and 10. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. It, it, you know what? It looks like it's not aligned because the 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 green square is the standard deviations along the axis. So you should uh, there. So the red dot is the same is aligned uh, around the whole chart is the same way, right? So so the red dot is positioned in uh, relative to the axis the same way, right? It's just the green triangle makes it look like it's uh, displaced. So from red dot, you basically for this currency you get here, for this currency you get here, because at some other initial rate level, this currency had a higher upward drift. So it combined it with the data, basically it's currency specific data, it combined it in, a, in what I think is a completely judicious way with the data uh, from um, <clears throat> all of the other currencies and predicted what would happen. So uh, I think with that, uh, you know, given we have 10 minutes left, uh, we probably shouldn't go back uh, to these examples. And again, I, I would encourage everybody to just download the code at random because they're extremely fascinating. I think that the way that machine learning basically reasons, uh, you will see how machine learning reasons about the data just by changing the parameters and changing how much data you're sending. So, so I think it's very fascinating to see how it's applied in practice. It's, it's much more interesting, I think it's much more clear than doing things like images where the whole thing this whole amazing thing happens kind of behind the scenes. So with finance, uh, everything is simpler and you can actually see exactly what the model does. So I'll encourage everybody to just run the code. Uh, and with that, uh, you know, I would like to um, uh, stop and ask for questions and uh, then we can wrap up. Thank you, Alexander. Does anyone have questions they can unmute themselves? Alexander, there's a question um, from Lindia yeah. around the RBM code. Uh, Not okay, yeah, so, so yes, yeah, so there's one question. Uh, share the slides and the RBM code. Um, uh, okay, so uh, uh, I'm certainly share the slides. Actually, I'm so, uh, uh, oh, you know, I, I, I think I apologize. Yeah, I know what happened. I think we pushed, uh, we have our own repository uh, that uh, Andrew and I were worked on the code. I, I think I forgot to push to GitHub. Uh, because uh, yesterday uh, I pushed the uh, part which has to do with yesterday's lecture, so we'll um, uh, we'll do it after the workshop. So, so I apologize. So, so you're right; it's not on GitHub yet, uh, uh, but uh, but it will be. Uh, and uh, the slides, uh, yes, yeah, so certainly will happy to share. So, it, 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 what's the best way to share the slides? Uh, uh, if I send them to you, will be be able? To, will you be able to distribute them to the participants? If you send them to Chris, he'll deal with them. Yeah. So uh, uh, unless unless we want to just upload, I'm not sure if Zoom um, uh, is able to. Yeah. Let's just let's just send it to uh, send them to Chris because um, uh, because uh, I don't know if you can actually share the files through Zoom. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, probably email is better. So we'll share the slides via email and uh, I'll make sure to push the code. So by the way, uh, uh, the person who was asking, so it's uh, uh, Lindia, uh, uh, so we were able to run yesterday's examples. i uh, just curious uh, because you know we, we, we wrote this code, so it's very easy for us to run. I just wanted to get some kind of data point on whether someone else could run it uh, without, uh, without assistance from us. 
Uh, okay, that's fine. Yeah, so so you just want to review it. That's fine. Yeah, so I just want to say that's actually an excellent point, right? So thank you for pointing it out, right? So uh, even if you're not planning to run the code, uh, you know, you can look at uh, and review it, uh, which is which is I think is also something that will go well uh, with the material. So please download the repo, even if you don't have PyCharm or not planning to run it. Uh, you know, I, I think I think it's it's actually useful to kind of just look how to. Uh, and uh, anybody who wants to run it uh, was there today. Uh, you can run it again. So if, let me just, if, if people want to run it, let me just um, uh, mention again. So all of the scripts, uh, actually not, not RBM scripts, but we're going to fix that and, and push uh, uh, for RBM as well. If you rename the script, it will also rename all of the output files. So to run it, basically what I do is that I just look at the script. Basically I go like, you know, save as, right? Uh, and I'll say, uh, save as, uh, you know, 1A, right? Okay, so I'll go here and then I'll say, okay, well, let's uh, add it to GitHub, right? And let's predict, uh, you know, a different currency, Asgard, right? Uh, and then I'm going to run it. Uh, so basically, if you want to run, um, you know, especially with, our, uh, oh, sorry, one second. Oh, I see, yeah, so I need to, sorry. Uh, basically, the, uh, uh, those, some of the scripts require input files, the, the ones that machine learning, right? So, so, so you also need to, um, of course, rename the. Um, uh, you also need to rename the, uh, the input, right? So let me rename the input. So basically, the inputs and the outputs all follow the script name. So I'm going to rename the input, uh, and also add to GitHub, and now I should be able to run it. Hopefully. Just running right. So, uh, so basically, uh, uh, the thing is, uh, for R for RBM, uh, the settings take an hour to cut to to, to train. So, what I normally do is, uh, you basically go and you know open a bunch of scripts. Right. So, go and open a bunch of scripts here. Uh, actually, second, yeah. So this one, like this one, and this one, right. Uh, and then I'm going to go and uh, run this, run that, right. So you can run them all in parallel uh, because uh, uh, you know we're not using parallel algorithms here. So each one of them will take only one CPU. So you have a bunch of CPUs, they can all run at the same time. And then you can uh, go and, um, uh, these are not saving the results, but uh, but you can also flip a flag and they will save the results uh, in in the folder. And then you can go look at the folder. Alternatively, you can just uh, scroll through all of the charts that are generated and, and look at the data. So basically in order to run it, uh, just you know, inst pip install, run anything in the run folder. Uh, after you know, you, you, if you have a PyTest installed, you can um, basically go to the tests uh, and uh, do your test like this, run run and you can do it in parallel with everything else. Uh, or you can go to runs folder, and uh, the idea is that um, uh, you run any script in the runs folder, any Py file will run, uh, and uh, if you rename it and rename its input, if it's there to the same name, then you can change the settings and it will not interfere with that one. And that's, I think, is the best way, best way to experiment with it. All right. Uh, any other questions so far? There was a question uh, um, uh, other than this one. Any questions on, on uh, so uh, questions on material or questions about uh, running? Okay, so uh, anything, uh, uh, any questions afterwards, I'm certainly happy to answer. So uh, so you can contact me on LinkedIn or you can contact me uh, you know, by, by email uh, and uh, you'll be happy to answer uh, anything that comes up after the workshop. Otherwise, uh, you know, it's exactly two hours. Uh, so perfect timing. Uh, we ran a little bit over yesterday, but uh, you know, today, today the timing was good. Uh, and uh, one last uh, request for questions, and then uh, I'll turn over to WBS for any final announcements before we close this this, uh, this workshop, which is the last event of the conference. No? Well, Alexander, thank you very much, for, and also for keeping time. Um, that does conclude the uh, the workshop here and then also the conference. So thank you everyone for your attendance and for your input and for all the questions and hopefully this has been helpful for you going forward. Uh, if you do have any further questions, do follow up with the, with the presenters or uh, with your WBS contact for any other questions if we can help you anyway. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. And uh, th th thank you for organizing this. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right.
Okay, bye everyone.